uh, although his name doesn't appear, hi, I'm Pat Shannon. Uh, although his name doesn't appear on the schedule, my son, uh, Timothy Patrick Shannon, uh, and I wrote the speech together. Uh, I mentioned him in a talk that I gave at the first Ruth Forum in uh, Detroit when he was 10. Uh, he's now uh, in Columbus, Ohio, uh, finishing, I hope, his uh, master's thesis on uh, the geography of li liquid resistance. So we're working uh, together. Here we go. Marx was right about capitalism. This is not only a conclusion that Wayne and Rich uh, offered in their 2009 Zenith uh, piece that shares its title with the one that uh, they gave this talk. We've heard it, uh, the same conclusion paraphrased the BBC and NPR. We've read it in the Wall Street Journal and the Globe and Mail, and we've seen it on Democracy Now! and HBO, Too Big to Fail. Capturing Marx's analysis, they state something like, Capitalism is a globalized, productive system that is innovating continuously in efforts to find and maximize profits, treating the earth and all that's on it as simply factors in its calculus. When capitalism's equations seem to work, as Dieter Borg suggested, everywhere we choose garbage disposals over love. <laughs> when history demonstrates that these equations don't add up, we get a chance to see how capitalism works melting all solids into air as wealth becomes concentrated in fewer and fewer hands, countries' borders cease to matter, and more people of every age, but most notably the young, face lifetimes of insecurity. There are winners, but mostly there are losers. We live currently in one of those historic times. Consider these examples. The World Economic Forum's uh, 2012 risk report suggests that what they call chronic fiscal imbalances, what we might call drastic income and wealth disparity, threatens to create world dystopia. The young without jobs or hope worldwide, elderly scraping by in bankrupt countries, and the environment in ruins. Although the 459 industrialists and world leaders surveyed for the forum's report framed this risk primarily as a threat to globalization and the flows of, kinds of all kinds of capital, from growing protectionism, nationalism, and populism, they do acknowledge that uh, the probability of dystopia is growing rapidly. In 2010, the forum rated dystopia as the fourth greatest risk among the top 50 facing the world. Apparently, every year they rate the top 50 risks. So this one you can dance to, so it doesn't matter. Uh, now it's uh, considered number one. What's happened between 2010 and today? Another example. There were murmurs last month in the Financial Times and the Wall Street Journal that Paul Forson, the International Monetary Fund's official in charge of Greek debt issue, has broken ranks with the IMF mantra of structural adjustment, stating, quote, we will have to slow down a little as far as fiscal adjustment is concerned and move faster, much faster, with the reforms needed to modernize the economy. Has the IMF gone soft? The young in Greece, Italy, Spain, Portugal, and Ireland haven't found international rules of lending any less invasive in their lives. As one Irisher put it, quote, all my buddies are in Boston, Melbourne, and Chicago looking for some work, end quote. To modernize an economy in the West is to privatize it, and to cut social services in order to uh, first regain and then maintain international bankers' confidence. But why the lighter foot on the throats of the Greeks? Last example. Youth unemployment is growing in most countries. Rates in, uh, in Europe uh, for workers under age 25 average around 20%, with those in Spain and Greece as high as 50%. In the United States, Canada, and Australia, young youth unemployment rates range between the mid and high teens, with unemployment for youth of color in the United States spiking at 50%. Youth with less education fare worse when seeking employment, and many job programs send the young to low-wage employment without benefits. Pressures to think shrink social safety nets leave the unemployed and underemployed in stressful positions that wear on their cognitive, civic, and social development that, according to Wilkerson and Pickett, in the spirit level, last a lifetime. Those who find work can plan uh, changing employment as many as 10 times before they drop dead. Retirement is an obsolete concept in the U.S. is where I come from. And for those who do not find work or find work that does not pay the living wage, 
as, as of last week in the United States, they'll be strip searched on their way to prison. After 30 years of neglecting rising un and underemployment of the young, even the 459 of the World Economic Forum acknowledged the trajectory as disturbing. What brought it to their attention? The answer, of course, to this, these questions is that some people around the world have connected rationality to power and then power to resistance. Their acts of resistance have taken different forms and they've used different media to represent themselves, their convictions, and their commitments to change. Their acts come in various sizes, intensities, and lengths. And they have, made, and they, they have become visible to all around the world through social media. We're referring to acts of the Roos Forum, Arab Spring, the International Occupy Movement, ad busters, flash protests in London, Paris, and Philadelphia, anonymous, students and union members in Madison, Wisconsin, and then Ohio, and there are many others that will be named today. Despite corporate media's attempts to frame these acts as hooliganism or silliness or cries for freedom, depending on their levels of threat to the powers of profit, these acts have caught the attention of the 1% and the governments that serve them. They rush to use various means to quell or accelerate the acts accordingly. Although we've not uh, talked to all the participants in these resistance groups, and we'll admit that there are differences ways that, that these groups connect rationality, power, and resistance, we imagine that they all have some iteration of a Marxian analysis. That capitalism, while remarkably productive and flexible, is exploited, oppressive, alienating, and destructive. Although most, most seek places in the economies that will not only sustain them, but will enable them to develop continuously as human beings, they seek to pr uh, protection from, if not the destruction of, the harsh realities of capitalism. In every case, these re resistors began by reading wide awake. This, we believe, is where teachers and other academics might play a vital role. By reading wide awake, we mean the participants in these acts of resistance read for social confidence in order to function well in society as it is, and they've also started to read with sociological imagination, waking up to connections between those daily lives and the social structures around them by identifying personal troubles as social issues. At some level, they recognize tension between expected confidence and unexpected imagination, noting the public pedagogies of institutions that present daily lessons concerning what they should know, who they should be, and what they should value. Those continuous but indeterminate lessons seek to position the public as passive aggressive individual consumers of commodities, ideas, and values. Institutions use specific pedagogical strategies that are not always readily apparent, but they are nonetheless there in the text they produce. Those texts, broadly defined, are supposed to be read in particular ways to position our social confidence. Yet resistors recognize that these lessons and texts are political and partisan, and they, seek that, uh, and they see that reading wide awake can realign connections between different rationalities and different forms of power. Resistors seek to defeat and subvert capitalist connections. Through those acts, they learn that capital ra capitalist rationality wields powers of representation, censorship, disabling and tracing communication, pepper spray, arrest, prison, and bullets in order to defeat reading wide awake and to dissuade their bodies. Teachers and other academics can encourage reading wide awake by articulating its process, engaging examples, and encouraging self-reflection on drawing conclusions too quickly or easily. For example, institutional public pedagogies offer different positions to different groups with radically different consequences, while at the same time promoting the mythical narratives of self-made success, equal equality before the law, free markets, and Jesus loves you. Teachers and other academics can help to expose these promises and consequences by exploring everything from happy meals to the real realignment of American collegiate sport conferences to representations of New Orleans on Google Earth to the worship of innovators, and then by identifying how various groups experience and are positioned by these things. Investigating the personal troubles of disappointment with a toy 
or the loss of loyalty and bitter rivalries with a still vine-covered night ward in New Orleans and over the short ends of creative destruction. We can encourage self and collective reflection on uh, competent lives that have been com commodified and the possibility of living differently imagined lives. Reflection on differences and the consequences of institutional lessons and even the resistors' actions keep reading wide awake in a constant state of becoming. The issues around which resistors form coalitions are temporal points of connection as individuals and groups act on priorities identified in the linking of personal troubles with social issues. The exploitive, oppressive, alienating, and destructive rationality and power of capitalism are one of many issues worthy of resistance. Class, as represented by the metaphor of we are the 99%, does not erase real differences that matter. Here, we think teachers and other academics have an important role, too, in sponsoring discussions across and about differences. Not in an attempt to reach consensus by downplaying differences, but in the hope of recognizing the power of dissensus, a form of agency that requires a willingness and an ability to shuffle creatively our multiple discourses in efforts to discover connections across differences that could develop into coalitions, produce future actions, and invent inclusive ways to work and live together with our differences. When we've participated in events like this uh, one today, groups have often formed around various theories behind connecting rationality, power, and resistance, and less often around multiple sets of tactics to act on these convictions. In those forums, groups stress their differences, we think, because they fear agendas of consensus that would rank social issues for all contexts. We don't seek such a consensus. In fact, we understand such acts as symbolic violence. We do hope, however, that in the spirit of Madison, Wisconsin, we here today can look uh, for ways to connect in order to act in concert to address mutual goals, knowing full well that we will part company and find new coalitions on other social issues. Laura, Tim Pat's sister and my daughter, attends the University of Wisconsin. She talks about overcoming agonistic realities of resistors when she discusses the emotional and political effects when the firefighters marched with full gear into the Capitol Rotunda in Madison, or when the police refused to clear the heckling galleries above the legislatures, or when the Green Bay Packers stood on the steps with the uh, resistors. Despite their differences of all, on all sorts of matters, these students, teachers, fire eaters, cops, and jocks were wide awake when reading Governor Walker's efforts to enforce the power of capitalist rationality by denying public employees the right to collect a bargain. I hear they're doing that here too. <clears throat> there uh, might not be too many issues where these groups' interests will coincide, but at that time, in that place, all developed and acted on a class consciousness that should make any Marxist smile. <laughs> not all uh, but all resistors do not and need not follow Marxist theories developing class consciousness by detecting and refuting ideologies to get to at the big T truth. And certainly teachers and other academics have choices concerning how they wish to theorize and act on the connections of rationality, power, and resistance. Bourdieu's theory invites us to investigate and disrupt the production and distribution of social types of capital that circulate through the environments, creating unequal power relationships. His work offers multiple points of entry to name and resist pedagogical actions and symbolic violence that teach us our various positions in all parts of our lives. Nancy Frazier asks us to acknowledge and to adjust our framing of issues of redistribution and recognition to include the political dimension of representation to augment our economic dimensions of redistribution and the cultural dimensions of recognition. Beyond the what and the who of justice, she asks us in times of globalization to think about the how of social justice. Foucault argued if we are all subject to discursive regimes of power, and if these regimes circulate through us but do not belong to us, then our resistance should be targeted at these regimes of power rather than at the 1% and their minions. Power is not something that emerges from the body, he states in hermeneutics of the subject, but rather power is produced through knowledge. 
Challenging knowledge then becomes our path to the possibilities of change. How might teachers and other academics participate in this resistance? Here, Tim and I uh, demonstrate our limits of our reading that will both be deepened and expanded by you in the audience and by the panel members for the rest of the afternoon on our time together. But we've got some thoughts on it. First, we must abandon the notion that we will discover one big T truth. Our realities are accumulations of competing representations that are attempting to uh, structure our thinking, and, uh, our thinking and our acting. By recognizing this multiplicity, we become conscious of the ways in which representations reflect rationalities, project power, and come to see that we cannot hope to find a necessary and certain big T truth. But rather, we must engage in a daily examination of the dangers we face in adopting any particular set of representations toward guiding our practices at all times and in all places. Second, we should recognize that any power scheme has contradictions within it that could lead to its destruction. If reason is to be the primary tool to detect vulnerabilities in the structures of capitalists and other rationalities and partisan representations, then we, must, uh, then we have options for our initial strategies and sites of engagement. Red Sears suggested that the promises of democracies include ideas that we are free and equal and that the government should reflect our ideas and our interests. Those participatory rights enable us to insert ourselves when democratic promises prove to be unmet. We can claim our rights to interrupt the speech patterns of capitalist representations of normal life that position us on the margin. Derrida tells us to invert arbitrary, powerful binaries that structure our understandings of ourselves and our lives, limiting us to rich or poor, smart or foolish, good or bad. Such work undercuts institutions' lessons that current thoughts and actions complicit in the production of inequalities and oppressions are simply expressions of our innate nature and not the result of socialization. Bordelard implores us, to, implores us to give in to the spectacles that capture our fancy, providing us with cheap and easy ways to express our excessive passion, passion and luring us into the stupor of hyper-reality, hyper-conformity, and hyper-consumerism. Here, reason does not lead us away from capital's connections between rationality and power, but rather asks us to party like it's 1999 until the foundation uh, of foundational contradictions of capitalism make it implode. If it were not for the Wall Street bailouts, we would have made Baudrillard a profit over the last decade. The popular social movements of 2011 show us the potential of situationists, if you like the Marxist board, or eventualists, if you borrow from Foucault. The resistance groups that we mentioned earlier and those that others will mention later today are likely to include participants who straddle these theories according to time and place, employing multiple tactics to identify, disrupt, and contest capitalist and other rationalities linked to power of confidence. They employ various uh, forms of leadership, from the tightly knit groups in the London summer to the crowds of the Occupy iterations around the world to anonymous swarms. They engage uh, different tactics from public art and performance to mobilizing people in the streets, to attacking the cyberspaces. The sum of all these acts of resistance has captured the attention of the 1% governments and NGOs at the front for capital. And although the sums of these acts has yet to terrify them, the connections of power to resistance have provoked concern and innovation and surveillance and suppression. As well as becoming participants in these and other uh, forms of resistance, teachers and other academics can demonstrate the re uh, reading wide awake that starts the connected process leading eventually to resistance. They can mentor others in these acts of becoming wide awake readers who recognize the power of dissensus among individuals and groups who identify and want to act on social issues. What might happen if teachers and academics connect rationality to power and power to resistance? It depends on how you theorize the possible connection. But at the very least, we can make some situations better for some people and ourselves, and at most, we might win, whatever the hell that is. Thank you.